Coming up, the Morgan 4-4 that had a new lease of life 100,000 miles and 25 years on, whose owner reckons it's good for another 25. But first, only 25,000 were built between 1970 and 1977, but a surprisingly large number still exist. The Triumph Stag was beset by problems when it launched, due to a combination of mechanical design flaws, shoddy manufacturing and patchy dealer maintenance. At the time these issues seemed insurmountable and became several more nails in British Leyland's coffin. Nowadays, as we'll see, overheating issues, the thing that many people remember stags for, have been pretty well solved and lucky owners can now enjoy their cars the way that Michelotti designed them to be enjoyed. Sophisticated, open-air fun for up to four. This stag was a surprise 50th birthday present for me from my husband. I'd always loved stags. Um, I already owned a Triumph Spitfire, so this was the next model up and John kindly bought it for my birthday. When I first had my stag, it was white and I wasn't very keen on white cars in those days. So I had the colour change to Tahiti Blue and it's been Tahiti Blue now for about 13 years. Probably. About that. Mm -hmm. um, so, for the first two years, we drove it around as it was. We took it on long journeys. We travelled all around France in it, put a few miles on its clock, and thoroughly enjoyed it. And when we finished thoroughly enjoying it, then it went to the restorers, and it was a long process to have the colour changed. It took a year. Um, and, Excellent work was done. It was rubbed right down to basic paint. In fact, before it had been white, it had been blue, a pe very, very pale blue. Um, so here it is in its present form, beautiful Tahiti blue. Originally, the upholstery in the car was tan, which went very nicely with white. But when I changed the outside colour, I had black upholstery put in. When I bought the car for Jill, I knew she was uh, keen on Triumphs and I decided in my mind that that would make a good birthday present for her. Uh, so I looked at a number of cars, mainly in the magazines because that was the main source of uh, buying cars in those days, much less so on the internet. And uh, I guess I looked at four, maybe five cars or chose four or five cars um, from the adverts I saw and two in particular caught my eye one of which wasn't too far from here and I went to see that car uh, decided it was it would have been okay but I thought it was worth looking at another one as well which was 250 miles away in Hampshire fortunately at that time I used to travel a lot on business uh, so I was able to um, go to Hampshire without raising suspicions about uh, <laughs> why are you making this long journey for no reason at all um, anyway I looked at the car uh, and I was reasonably impressed by it. It, it wasn't immaculate by any means, uh, but it seemed to be sound. Uh, it seemed to have possibilities for restoration, which is what I wanted, and it wasn't excessively expensive. Um, so having haggled a bit, negotiated a price, uh, I went, came back home, obviously didn't say anything, and then on a, another business trip, uh, I went down to Hampshire again. This time I had to, um, to be a bit more surreptitious because I had to do this business trip without taking my car down there <laughs> so that I could drive this other one back. Uh, then I had the problem of what to do with it when I got it here. But it was fortunate that some friends of ours who were very keen Triumph fanatics uh, lived not far away and I was able to park the car under their carport um, and keep it out of the way, should we say. I was a little concerned that Jill might um, see it as she walked past, but then I thought, well, she's not going to know it's hers. She knows these people are Triumph fanatics, so there's no harm in her seeing it anyway. Uh, it was fortunate that the 
the son of the couple who, who we left the car with, he is a, a specialist in restoring Triumphs anyway, and I asked him to do some jobs on the car just to make sure it was uh, in good condition by the time Jill received it. So this was intended for Jill's birthday. We had a party on the evening before Jill's birthday, and when it came to midnight, uh, I mean, everyone knew it was going to be Jill's birthday, so I gave her a little booklet with quite a few... a big booklet. Well, quite a big booklet, all right, with some explanatory notes and some photographs. And it wasn't obvious it was a car to start with. I no, read through many pages before I found out it was a car. Yes, I had I various reports and technical data on this car. It was quite funny. Eventually, it got to the the end of it and it showed a picture of the car so she did then by by then realize that it was a car that I was offering and not uh, not just some arbitrary picture book. The morning after my party um, I was looking forward to seeing my car for real I'd only seen a picture of it and unfortunately I was a little worse for wear having drunk a little bit too much the night before and had a massive hangover so it wasn't till about three o'clock in the afternoon when I was able to leave my bed <laughs> and come out and see it and it was a lovely sunny day and we went out for a ride in it so it was nice Even when the Mercury is in single figures, the Stag's big V8 means there's plenty of heat available for driver and passengers, making top-down motoring a possibility whenever it isn't raining. Most Stags have retractable soft tops. Some have removable hard tops too. This car is really wonderful to drive, it's got plenty of power, I feel really good in it. Having had a Triumph Spitfire with a lot less power and to, to have this, it's a luxury car, certainly for its age, there's plenty of seat space, uh, it's nice and warm, it's not, not a problem having the roof down um, and it makes wonderful noises. The engine has a fantastic noise, especially if you're going between high walls and you get the reverberation off the walls. Absolutely fantastic sound. And I love it to bits. As far as we're concerned, this car has been extremely reliable. Uh, Stags didn't have a good reputation when they were first built, mainly because they were prone to overheating. And that's a particular problem because of where the water pump is and the fact that uh, the, the design of the cylinder heads and that sort of thing. But frankly, with today's technology and a, a bit of sensible maintenance, you can really avoid all these problems. And we've never had a single problem with the car overheating or causing any problems like that. Um, and frankly, the only real problems we've had, which are quite trivial, uh, are that the starter motor sometimes doesn't work properly, but you can usually avoid or overcome that problem quite easily. Um, and really that's about it, quite honestly. Uh, I mean, I've done quite a bit of work on the car myself to make sure it's, uh, it's satisfactory. Um, you put an electric fan on, didn't you? I put an electric fan to on, cool but that's, that's part of the overheating problem, you mm. know, just to ensure that when we go into a hot climate, the south of France, for example, we've got enough cooling to make sure it uh, doesn't overheat. Um, but apart from things like that, we've really had no, no major problems at all. The car has uh, a three-litre V8 engine. Uh, as I understand it, the origins of this engine were they were basically two four-cylinder engines joined together. And the four-cylinder engines were originally designed by Triumph to sell to Saab. So that is my understanding of its, its origins. So under the bonnet there, we have uh, a nice V8 engine. It's um, not too difficult to work on, although the cylinder heads, as I mentioned before, can be a little awkward. 
This particular car has got a manual gearbox with overdrive. Uh, many of these cars had automatic gearboxes, but I preferred a manual from the outset. Um, the suspension is independent suspension all round, and broadly speaking, it's, it's a fairly conventional car for its time in terms of uh, design. Unlike many earlier Triumphs, it doesn't have a separate chassis, but it has bracing, as one can see on the roof, uh, to stiffen the structure up. Uh, there's always a problem with sports cars which tend to be a bit flexible in the middle. Well, this bracing does have quite a, a significant effect and it does stiffen the uh, car up. And I've always been uh, quite happy with the car, which is why I was prepared to spend quite a bit of money on having it restored. Because if I hadn't been happy with it, either its basic performance or its uh, construction, I probably wouldn't have wanted to spend that money. So the fact I've done it means that uh, you know, to me it's a, it's a car worthy of its type. And as I understand, a surprisingly large number of stags which were originally sold still exist. Most of them are hidden away in garages, of course, and only come out on fine days. But, uh, you know, many more than you would expect, given its reputation when it was first built. The car has been very reliable, but of course I haven't used it as an everyday car. It's been a fun car, it's been a weekend car, it's a car to go out and enjoy the countryside in and meet friends. It is not a car that you would use for your day-to-day -day activities. I think because it's too precious. So, much pampering in the Miles household keeps this particular stag running superbly and looking good too. We belong to a, a Triumph Appreciation Club and there are people who have anything from a little Triumph Herald, which might not cost them very much, but they have great fun with it. We have great fun as a club. You get a nice social life with a classic car. Um, you have monthly meetings, you discuss problems, you go out on runs uh, and you meet up. It's great fun. You can buy a classic car for as little as a thousand pounds and that'll be a perfectly good car to enable you to join the club and really enjoy the social life of the club and that's most of what it's all about because you, you go to club meetings maybe once a month but then there are all sorts of events you can go to where the car is the centre of the attraction. Uh, and there'll be lots of other cars there for the same reason and everyone starts talking about them and you simply enjoy the cars basically and that's what it's for. If you're looking to buy a classic car either as an investment or for pleasure you have to decide what you can afford first of all. Um, to be perfectly honest if you're buying it simply as an investment you have to recognize that these cars cost money to run. If there's anything wrong with them, you've got to spend money to restore them. It's often not economical to buy a car, restore it and sell it on again and expect to make money. So really the, the answer is you should be looking to buy the car for pleasure. Um, then you've simply got to uh, understand the costs involved in it. You've got to buy a car that you like, of course, but fundamentally, uh, uh, you know, you can buy cars for as little as a thousand pounds up to a, a million pounds if you really want to spend a lot of money on a supercar. Um, this is somewhere at the bottom end of that range. About three years ago, we were taking our car out on its uh, a weekend break to meet our friends. It was a lovely sunny day, so we had the roof down. It was early May. Um, we were nearly at our lunch stop where we're meeting up with friends in, the, uh, in, a, in a very nice public house when we pulled up at a roundabout and we'd stopped unfortunately the car behind us a new one uh, failed to stop and it hit us in the back at about 30 miles an hour and my car was reduced to sort of like that and i was quite upset you can imagine fortunately the third party insurer was quite um, relaxed, not relaxed perhaps, but uh, more flexible than I would have expected. They sent a specialist uh, inspector out who knew a lot about old cars 
and he didn't attempt to, uh, to write the car off. He said he thought it was worth restoring. And eventually, after another year, it emerged in the state you see it now. Very pleased to have my car back after a year, as good as new. It'll go on until I die, probably, now. <laughs> the Triumph Stag. Choose a good one and you'll have the best of classic open-air motoring with all the creature comforts of a modern car. The stag's fun, reasonably frugal, and relatively easy to keep on the road. Now isn't that the ideal classic? Meet Steve Wharton, serial Morgan enthusiast. Steve's had Morgans for a good few years and, usefully for us, has become rather an expert on the mark. So when did Morgan start? The firm was started in, I think, 1909, so it's been going over 100 years. They started making three-wheelers originally, and they made three-wheelers up to 1936, I believe. And then they brought out the 4-4, which meant four cylinders, four wheels. And this is a 4-4, four, four, four cylinders, four wheels. So they still call this model after the original one. Um, superficially, they look very similar, except in the 1930s, the radiator was separate, not cowled in, as in this model. This one's quite special. These days I tend to keep it for sunny days or going on holiday. In. I bought it about nine years ago. It had been completely rebuilt from, by all accounts, something that was very tired. Originally it had done about 100,000 miles and uh, a guy in Cheshire bought it and rebuilt it with a new chassis, new wood frame, and most of the bodywork's new as well. I think the rear wings are the only original part of the first car. He rebuilt the engine and tuned it. It's got twin Weber carburettors, big valves, um, balanced bottom end, balanced pistons, and a five-speed gearbox, which makes it much more usable in modern traffic on a motorway. In terms of performance, um, they say that an engine in that state of tune would get about 130 brake horsepower which in a light car means it's quite potent actually, even by modern day standards. The power to weight ratio is around 200 brake horsepower to the tonne, which is quite high. And quite, it, it does make it fun to drive, but you've got to be careful with the petrol consumption and I have um, made the engine a little bit tired once or twice. Basically I started it up about two months ago and it started smoking and blowing fumes out of the top end of the engine and um, at traffic lights you were basically peering through it was like a steam engine coming out through the louvers in the top of the bonnet it turned out that uh, two of the pistons were damaged and the uh, piston rings were worn as well so really it's had a complete engine rebuild now so fingers crossed it's good for another few years <laughs> Like 
most days in Britain, rain tends to be a feature. But that doesn't deter Steve. The Morgan's aero screens don't even have the luxury of windscreen wipers. I started getting interested in Morgans in the mid-70s. I used to go to watch motor racing and these old cars seem to be doing rather well. In fact, I can remember one won the national championship in about 1978. And then I realised that because there was a waiting list, if you bought one new, you could actually sell it for more than you paid for it after a couple of years. So that seemed ideal in various respects. So I bought a new one and I've had them on and off ever since. Um, I bought it in 76 and I ordered a new one almost immediately afterwards because I did enjoy it and when that was delivered in 1981 I traded in the original one for £5,000 and it had cost me just over £3,000 to buy new but obviously inflation was quite high in those days so you can't really do an accurate comparison. I wanted something that was a bit more unusual, I'd had a couple of try and spitfires before that and something with a bit more go in it as well and also I was wary of exotic things like lotuses because the engines had a reputation of being a bit frail and I didn't like fiberglass cars and a lot of low production cars are fiberglass and I got into the tradition they've been building them for so long and there was masses of history to them so that's what really appealed and then they're great fun. Morgan's always been popular because they've had a degree of exclusivity and they've had a reasonable amount of performance for quite a good price. They've been built like that since the early 50s. That, that was the last time they were restyled and they're still making them now in 2012, virtually the same. They're constructed by having a traditional chassis, which isn't wood, much as people often say. Um, you have two Longitudinal chassis members with a couple of cross members, a steel cowl, a steel scuttle here, and then an ash frame which runs round and supports the bodywork. The bodywork on this and the bonnet, which is just bolted to the bulkhead and the cowl, so it can be lifted clear completely if you need to, they're aluminium. The wings on this are aluminium, they're just bolted to the chassis and to the body. Same with the back wings. Fairly straightforward, which again is one reason they're so popular, because you can actually rebuild them yourself if you're good. I couldn't do it, but uh, somebody's done that one.
So the fluid suspension on the Morgan is unique to Morgan. It was designed by HFS Morgan in the early 20th century. It consists of two vertical pillars which are on which the hub is mounted and then two cross tubes that go across to the other side. There's a spring above and below the hub so the whole wheel moves vertically. So it's a crude form of independent suspension or a very early form of independent suspension. And at the back there's a longitudinal leaf spring and a lever arm shock absorber. Very straightforward, common to a lot of 50s, 60s sports cars. Some cars have got steel wings, but this is aluminium wings, aluminium body, and aluminium body panels as well. So it makes it quite light. Morgans have always been sporting cars, so even the three-wheelers were raced at Brooklands and won lots and lots of prizes. Uh, they were called cycle cars rather than real cars, a cross between a motorcycle and a car. Um, more recently, they still appeal to enthusiasts because they're not the most comfortable of cars, but they are quite sporting. The driving experience in a Morgan is exciting and fun. Well, yes, that just about sums it up. But detractors might add something less than polite about the ride. You could say that, essentially, a Morgan, any Morgan, defies logic in terms of its design and how it's built. But that's the point. Morgans wouldn't be, well, Morgans if they were designed or built any other way. And their loyal owners like Steve, 30 years on and counting, love them just the way they are. If any mark could be an instant classic, Morgan would be head of the queue. Long may it continue.